Good day to, to children of God, our brothers and sisters, pastors. I greet you all in the lovely name of Jesus. I want to thank the NOV for this privilege that we have as the Welfare Department to be part of this empowerment session. And I trust that I will challenge you, and at the same time, you challenge me with questions that will follow after this presentation. I'm going to talk to you about, obviously, the alignment between welfare and the very important driver of community involvement. And I'm, I have, what I have here is to talk about making a difference through community involvement. Um, what can the church do to make a difference in the lives of people and at the same time adhere to the, the very important, as I said, driver of community involvement? I want to premise what I will be sharing with you on our spiritual theme for 2022. And it comes from Micah 6, verse 8, and it says, it says as follows, He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, and to do kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. So there are three things that flow from this particular scripture, and obviously the one I will focus on is from a welfare point of view, is the kindness or the mercy, but the other two are equally important. So doing justice, loving mercy, and walking humbly with God. So let's talk about justice, doing justice. So God tells us, instructs us to do justice. We have often defined justice by placing it in the judicial realm, talking more of justice from that point of view, but from our point of view as Christians, it's about creating a world where all people have equal opportunities to develop the gifts God has given to them. The second one is loving mercy. So God desires us to love mercy, to be merciful, to be kind to others. And translation is clear that mercy equals kindness. In terms of the referencing there is God's kindness towards us. So mercy we have received and mercy we should give. God wanting us to be drawn by, to mercy by instructing us to have compassion for those. Even the child on the street begging for money to be rolled up our window or to be to roll down our window and ask the boy, why aren't you at school? Where's your parents? And engage them in that way. In hearing what God says, as for as one of my people, I hope you love mercy, for that is what you have received. And the last one is walking humbly with God. Um, it's, it's clear what that instruction means, but because God wants us to invest in the world by being humble, even if we are children of God, not to look down upon the sinners, because we were sinners before and we are there through His grace. So I trust that you'll be challenged with that and just take that to heart, because that is our theme, our spiritual theme for this year. So allow me just to do a quick round of what are our present activities. Now, let me take the, go back to the background. You see, the Executive Welfare Council of the AFM South Africa is a department of the Church. It is the Welfare Ministry of the Church. And although the department is there, every one of us have a responsibility in terms of looking after the orphans and the widows, people with disabilities. Clearly, that's important. So we were registered as an NPO, as a Welfare Council in 1938 and then later as an NPO. And our mission is to render relevant and accessible services to vulnerable persons and families in a changing South Africa. So there's a challenge because things are changing as we talk. So Nelson Mandela says, There can be no keener revelation of a society's soul than the way it treats its children. And our focus obviously has to be on children because they are the future. Our future. Without children, we don't have a future. So it's important for us to look after our children. Let's contextualize the discussion here today when we talk about the challenges that face us in South Africa. Firstly, we talk about poverty, high employment and inequality issues around the economic situation in South Africa. So vital for us to, 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 to see that because despite the changes in government um, from one dispensation to a new dispensation, we still have poverty. Then crime is an issue involved whether it's blue-collar crime, or whether it's white-collar crime, corruption is also a crime. Family breakdown. We have more and more of that happening, especially now with the COVID-19, where families are breaking up and our children are suffering as well. Vulnerable, 
people like children, women and older persons, people with disabilities, are the targets for violence, gender-based violence as such as well. And then obviously substance abuse and drug addiction and AIDS, those are the challenges we have and it's important for us to keep that in the back of our minds as we have this discussion about the role of the church in the community, especially the community surrounding the church. So South Africa is the missional context in which we demonstrate as a church, as a welfare department, part of the church, and committing ourselves to improve the lives of people in our own assemblies. I'll say this once again. We start, charity starts at home. We've got to look at the welfare of our own people um, as part, that are a part of our assemblies. So allow me to introduce you to our governing board, um, Pastor Baden Peterson, who is now the, the deputy uh, uh, um, president. Um, vice chairperson is Pastor John Simons. Um, secretary is Pastor Trevor Herbert. Treasurer is Pastor Rudy Kurson. Now the general treasurer of our church, and the other members are Advocate Molly Malete, the only lady for now. I'm hoping that will change in the future. Pastors Bongani, Mashobani, Lazarus Chauke, and Ezra Mbunambi. Those are the, 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 the board members. And we, as the staff members or management, support them as non-voting members. Myself, Pastor Peter De Witt, and Pastor Bongi um, Naile. Right. So, if we look at... Our income, our main sources are still government funding, fundraising activities, donations in kind and cash, corporate and individual donors. I must say a lot of it has dried up. So we are struggling a bit more than we have struggled in the past. Um, in the past it led to a major crisis. Today we have still a shortfall and we are getting support from churches, but that can improve we need to engage into a partnership where you see us doing the work on your behalf as well. So churches are playing a very important role. The assemblies and many of them are anchor assemblies and they meet a lot of our, 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 our children's needs. Their involvement, their financial involvement play a very important part. And once again, thank you to them and then for other fees and rentals and sales um, that, we are, that we also have also make up our income development. So, let me then now talk about the work of the AFM Welfare. Initially, there was a lot of focus on institutions. We had one large children's home. It was later on decided to move away from the large complex and have smaller houses in various communities throughout South Africa, except in KZN. We had houses in KZN too. But we have these houses, and in those houses, children are then placed with a house mother, as we called them in the past, it's called now center managers. But for each of them, there is a committee that's dedicated to provide support to the staff members and through their staff members to the children as well. So whilst the focus was on children and older persons, and also there we have three types of older homes, we have frail care in Kurz River, in Sarepta, and in Toz River, and it's important that we carry on supporting them. They have a shortfall of about 50,000 rand a month, so we need the churches to, to come in as anchors and provide support to them as well. And then we have, uh, um, we have facilities for assisted living, and we have facilities for independent living as well. So we, I will talk a bit more about that later on. But we moved away from institutions not doing away with them, we will still continue with the institutions, but to a more community development focus, and that is in line with the community involvement process. And I think it's important, or the, the drive of community involvement, because the two comes together. We come in with a social work skill around <coughs> community development, <coughs> and we provide support and impetus to the driver from a welfare point of view. But it's important that we say this, that much more work is being done with and through churches. And although we don't have a full picture of the impact, I know that the impact is much bigger. For example, we have about 1,000, 1,200 people living in our institutions, children and older persons, but we have about seven to 9,000 people that are impacted upon in the places that we know. We don't have all of the information. I'm sure that number is close to 2,000. So I think it's important that we acknowledge that the church can play a bigger role 
and, and then if we measure the impact, it's much, much bigger in that particular way. So it is important that we also look at how we strengthen the community development or our Umanadisi project or program. And then we also have a new welfare identity. And it will be shown on the screen and you will see the hand with a cross in the middle and you'll see the linkage between our logo and the church's logo, the same colors, but also very important in terms of a helping hand and supporting others and all of that. Yeah, please look at that and when you see that, um, it's important for you just to acknowledge and respect um, the important work that's being done under that, the auspices of that logo in terms of God's grace in the cross and giving us the wisdom and the opportunity to serve others. So, so now we're going to talk about how do you operationalize what we spoke about earlier on, the one game plan driver community involvement. So I'm going to talk to the church more directly and give examples and make suggestions and obviously it's up to every church to take whatever component of this discussion and go and implement it. But more importantly is that we don't leave you alone to do that. We at, as the welfare department have the skills, we have the, the tools to help you to achieve whatever you want to achieve. I'm, I'm, what I will do now is to stimulate you to make sure that you are stimulated in terms of taking examples from here and take it in, in, into practice. So let me use a broader theme around that, that we are using all the time, and that is making a bigger impact, making a difference in the lives of people in the community through and with, or with and through assemblies. The with part is ourselves partnering with you, and the work that you are doing supported by us, but also on your own and you run with it in the community. And all we do is partner and we, we like to get some reports on what you do so that we can measure the impact of the work that we are doing together. On the slide you will now see that I have the one game plan just to bring into, into context of the other five areas, discipleship, empowerment, economical, economical um, involvement, community involvement and governance, all five very important, but the one that stands out in terms of welfare, as I said earlier on, is community involvement. And then please go back to the values, go back to the, 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 the scriptures, Matthew 28 verse 19, all those important components of the One Game Plan, so that you can see how that also is shown through community involvement going forward. So, AFM assemblies are called to get involved in their communities, not only in their communities in terms of the positive side, the church side, because the church is a small community within a building, within a church. It is, represents the challenges and the problems that we've raised early on. So it's important for us as a church to understand and to be involved in dealing with the challenges of the local assembly. You see, pastors and leaders Youth leaders and Sunday school teachers need to know how to deal, for example, with child protection issues when a child is abused. If an older person is abused, it's important for them to know what to do, what are the resources, what, where do they go to, and, and we have provided information in the past and we will continue to provide information as well. A lot of the assemblies are excited about getting involved because it's their community, they understand the community. They need to do a profile, profiling of the of, of, of that particular community. How many older persons are there? How many people with disabilities are there? How many welfare organizations? So that they can partner with the schools, with the welfare departments, organizations, government, and so on, in making that change so that we are not, although we are, in, in, a, in a true sense of the word, the community, there are other people doing work, so let's not reinvent the wheel. Let's work with those organizations and departments. We have the tools, the programs, and the information, as I said, to support you. So let's give meaning now to the one AFM game plan driver. Community involvement through the community development project that we have, Umana Lisi, and we bring the two together in the following few slides. So what is community involvement? What is community where the services are rendered to the community, where you are involved in, on committees or whatever, <clears throat> you understand that role that you have to fulfill. It's helping others to meet their needs. 
It's reaching out to people in need. Those vagrants, those people that, that are homeless, those wives and, and women that are abused, those children that run away when the father comes home drunk every Friday night. Do you know what's happening there? Are you involved? And sometimes it happens in our church as well. The people that are sitting there, do we ask them, why were you not in church? Or do we ask them, how are you? Can I understand why you weren't in church? In a different way, the same question, but you are talking to the needs of people. Doing good to others, uplifting of people. And, and, and we have so many testimonies where people were unemployed and drunk and on the streets and they came to know the Lord and they became elders. So many stories, many of us can, uh, were in those situations as well. So don't look down on them. Are you, do, are you aware of that? You've got to be involved, aware of that because as a pastor you are, you are one of those leaders that you have to fulfill the roles of a teacher, of a social worker, of a doctor because people come to you first. You have to understand the community. It's about making a difference in the lives of people. Every day they have challenges. How are we helping? Serving on various community structures, including schools, and then welfare committees or NPO committees as well, and other structures in the organization, in, in, the, in the community. Community involvement entails work done by a person or a group of people or a church or an assembly that benefits others. It's not about yourself. If you're doing it for yourself, then, then don't do it. You have to have a heart for people and do that for them. It's about volunteering your services. Don't expect payment when you serve on these committees because you are giving of yourself, you're giving your knowledge, you're giving your expertise. In whatever field you are, you bring that into that welfare organization, into that school, and you're providing that kind of support. It's about helping many different groups of people, children, senior citizens, older persons, people with disabilities, women that are abused, men that are abused. It's providing support to them as well. And then it's participating in community service because of the importance and the calling and the instruction from God to help others and also to improve the community. You see, if you improve the lives of a, of a, of a family, you are, you are starting to improve the lives of people in the community and therefore the community and, and, and the city as well. Some very important questions that you have to ask yourself when you get involved following, who do you like, who would you like to help? It's important for you to start focusing. Don't try and save the world. You can't help everyone. All of us know the story of the starfish. It's that one person, that one project, start with that, make it a success, and then you move to others. But ask yourself, is there a specific group? Is it older persons? Is it people with disabilities? Is it children? What are your focus areas? Secondly, do you want a community service activity just as, like for example, the welfare weekend that we have? Everything happens around that on one Sunday a year, or is it something you want to do on an ongoing basis, making a difference in the lives of people ongoing, not just once off? And then lastly, it's about the impact as well. Not that you want the church to get a name, but you want to know whether your services are appreciated and it's successful as well. So it's important to ask these three questions when you are starting to look at what you are doing. Also, when you review what you have done already. So what are the benefits? And it's important for us to understand that there are benefits for you as a church, for you as a group in the church, and for you as an individual as well. The first benefit is it gives you a way. It provides the opportunity for you to help others to identify their needs and to understand the resources and to bring their needs with those resources, whether it's an, a child welfare organization, whether it's an older child, whatever their needs are, or even SASA for that matter, because that's an important um, factor in the whole area of, of poverty alleviation. The other benefits are making a difference in the lives of others. We've talked with that. Help improve your community because it's a broader process, like I said early on, it often results in personal growth, your own growth and the development and you see the change in others. And that's why gardening is so important because when you see how the plant grows, you appreciate your own garden. The same thing applies when you invest and you, and you toil in the community in those dirty streets where people are sleeping and you go out there and you feed them, you go talk to them and you encourage them to come to church. But don't do it for the sake of the church only, do it because 
You want God to talk through your life, your kindness to them as well. It also gives you a chance to gain new experiences and to live out your calling and your passion. So this opportunity for you just to, to make a difference in that particular way. So let me now talk as I move towards the end about 17 ways that the church can be taken from our buildings into the streets, into the community. So I'm a, I have a heading uh, for a few of those. The first two is under the heading, Embrace, an expensive concept, expansive concept of community. Community is wide and it just grows and it grows as, as we get involved in the community. The first one is, Learn to regard your community as an extension of your congregation. It's not just the church and the people in that church. The people live in those communities. Do you know their neighbors? Do you know the challenges they have? A church's mission field goes beyond its membership to include all the people God calls it to serve. It's about connecting with individuals who never set foot in your church. They might not even be in other churches. They might not even be attending a church. They might be in other churches as well, but you've got to reach out to them. I don't want to bury this person because they are not members of our church. It's often an attitude that we have. It's at funerals that people that never come to your church come to your church where they hear the message of God and the challenge from God. So open yourselves up for the community. Don't sit in your church building number two, waiting for people to come. Be prepared to go to the people where they are. Very important. So that's important for you to understand the concept of church within the community and community within the church. Number two, B is prepare spiritually. Just don't get into this without taking God with you. You've got to pray, you've got to read the Bible, you have to wait upon the Lord as well. So number three in terms of the 17 areas is acknowledge the synergy between the great commandment of Matthew 22 which says love your neighbor as yourself and the great commission in Matthew 28, go and make disciples. Marry those two verses and then you get to the welfare, the welfare hearts of people as well. Number four, remember that Jesus primarily engaged people through everyday encounters. Now and then he was at, at, at a temple, but he was chasing people out <clears throat> because they were abusing the, 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 those temples. He was on the streets meeting the needs of people. Follow that example. He fed people. He met the everyday, the everyday needs. He enjoyed the fellowship with other people. Number five, express love and compassion for your community in big and small ways. Never think that the small way is not important. Avoid to be judgmental as well. So those are the three areas under prepare spirit, spiritually for your, the work that you're going to do. Number three of C, get to know the community surrounding your church. Do research number six. First point, do your research beforehand and see what others have done in the past and what has worked and what hasn't. Talk to local leaders, talk to social workers, talk to the community workers, people in the community that understand, talk to those NPOs and get information from them so that you understand this is a new area. You don't have to do the same thing because you can rather piggyback and work with the others. Review the demographic data from the public, from, from, from government structures, private and the different church structures, and don't assume the statistics alone will tell the whole story. You've got to go on the street and ask those questions yourself. Number eight, which is part of that, getting to know the community. Get out in your community, walk the streets, map the area, record your observations, and note how the community is changing. Number nine, assess the community needs. What are the needs of your context in the small area? But how does the bigger community impact on your area of work around your church, your assembly? Who are your neighbors? Do you support your neighbors? Because remember as a church you are in a community and there are people living around you that are not in front of your church. How do you support them? Do you know their needs and are you talking to them? And how can you serve them is a very important question. D, very important, listen and learn. Number 10, in terms of 17 points, interview residents in the community. When you now go out and you find out, sit in a park, go to a restaurant, a coffee shop, and ask questions like, what are your challenges? 
What are your, your hopes? What are you longing for for this community? In one of the communities where I serve, as, where, where I am part of a church in Yesiris, so many of the buildings have been broken down. So many of, of things that kept the young people busy, those things are no longer there. And it's important to talk to people and understand what can you do to make a difference in their lives? How can you keep your young people busy? Just one very good idea is to have an after care, a school, after school care center at, at your church where you can do four things. You can give them a safe space, you can give them some food, you can give them some, some uh, time for homework and also some recreation time. Easy as that, all you need is a, a person like a teacher that has been retired and start a group of young people and keep them safe. Many of them are just in the streets because their parents are working. Get to know number 11, the major government officials. They are people with tremendous influence. Then number E says you've got to build relationships. In anything that you do, in families, in churches, it's about relationships. So build authentic relationships is E. Number 12, strive to make a meaningful engagement with others. Number 13, Make sure that you are reaching out to people for the right reasons. If your motive is to get more people in your church, people will see right through you. It must be about their needs, supporting them. They will then come automatically, not for you to even invite them to come. But even if they don't come, your church is now much broader. It's not just the church building, it's the community. Collaborate, I said that earlier, with others that are also passionate about the community. Don't reinvent the world, number 15, if you can partner with another church, another organization in serving the community. They will come back and serve, support you. You go out and support them as well. Number 16, challenge each church group with an inside focus to find a way to become involved with the community outside the church. So I'm talking about your existing ministries. So F is turn your existing ministries around. They must now be outward and not just inward. So your choir might want to go sing at the old age home. Your youth group might organize a sports day at the children's home. Your board can sponsor a neighborhood cleanup. Easy things to do that you can just take out to the community. Number 17, Bold relationships with those taking part in existing programs that serve the community, such as a literacy class, food pantries, clothing bank users, daycare facilities. In that particular way, you are bringing resources to your own church because there are people in there that need to those, those, those ones as well. So please work in the community, integrate yourself in the community. So that's number 17, and those are some things that you can take to the community. So what is community development? Because I want to bring the link, and in closure, I want to say, community development seeks the empowerment of the local communities taken to mean both geographical communities, communities of interest or identity, and communities organizing around specific topics. Now, you can see what we're talking about in community involvement, you are finding in community development, and therefore the two must get together, and that's where we can help you as well. So we are here to serve as the AFM department and we've now taken some things that the church is already doing under five important areas, namely child protection and family strengthening, care of and the protection of older persons and persons with disabilities, number two. Number three is social health services, number four, social education, schools, ECD, and then social economic. Let me just give you a few examples very quickly around children. It's children's groups, it's shelters, it's, it's child care centers. It's foster homes, I spoke about the after-school center and drop-in centers, although that falls under the Department of Education or the Education one. Family support, victim empowerment centers, because there are so many of our ladies that are still being abused, they need a place to come and talk. Support groups for parents that have children with drugs, parenting skills training, marriage enrichment programs, and uh, a large number of, of things more. And I would like to offer, and I'm, I'm sharing this with all of the congregations, I was fortunate to be asked by the MEC and later by the HOD of Social Development in Gauteng with my wife to develop a manual on, on effective parenting skills. Invite me um, and we are, we'll come and train your leaders to train others um, in, in family, in, in, in these skills that's required. It's, a, it's an eight session, but we'll try and do it in two days and you can then take it further in those two days as well. 
So under the other areas of, of, of social health, let me start with older persons first. The first example there is community-based in home case care, but we, we can't all afford older homes buildings, but you can use your church as a service center for older persons. So support families, it's important that you support their families or within the family context so that they remain there and you provide them with support. And then obviously an older persons group. People with disabilities, often they are left alone, they need support. So it's important for community and home-based care to be taken to the people with disabilities, supporting once again the family because they don't know what to do. I have a child with a disability and I promised that child when the child was born and I understood that he was a Down syndrome child, <coughs> sorry, I understood what his needs would be and I made a commitment with my wife and our family that never will the child be in an institution and he's today 25 years old and happy to live at home and to work in a, a protective workshop. Support of the families, we need that support, and then obviously groups for families that have people with disabilities, and then also groups for people with disabilities to talk to one another. Number three, social health services. We're talking about AIDS, we're talking about drug abuse, and I know people want to have buildings, but we have nice models around substance abuse where, they, where some churches already have and a kind of a, a center where people come in the day to be given the support that they need. And then AIDS, raising awareness, supporting patients. Now with the pandemic, you don't hardly hear about AIDS, but it's still a reality and it's important for us to be aware and to support and to deal with the stigmas around AIDS. And then social education, we're talking about schools, early childhood development or creches, literacy programs and after school centers, as I've mentioned. And then lastly, under socioeconomic services, we have poverty alleviation, um, services like soup kitchens, social relief, food parcels, clothing distribution, small scale farming. And when you give out clothes, don't give them clothes that are torn. Give them clothes that are uh, ironed, that you don't wear anymore, so that people can still use it. Don't give them your throwaways. Job creation, you need to help people, young people especially, to upskill, assist them with, with their CVs for job interviews. Empowerment, look at the whole issue around inequality. Women empowerment and youth development are important components and we can help set up and deal with those issues and give you more information around that. How can we serve you as a church in a final word of closing? And then there's another one where I can I'll ask you, how can you serve us and how can you support us in our role? The first one is, like I've just spoken, I've given you a whole range of issues around the community involvement driver. Number two, to provide technical support and address social challenges, needs identified by various regions by having a one-day power, power, pastoral, pastoral uh, empowerment or even a session in one of those days. A regional mini welfare conference, a welfare conference where we can come in with speakers and so support you with your conference. A presentation at your regional leadership forum meeting. A pastor's toolkit, we are still working on that, how to address these social challenges so that you have a document in, in, uh, in your hands on 10 different social problems and what you can do and what your role is as a pastor. And then training of trainers. I've spoken about the parenting skills one, where we train trainers to train people in your community, to train people in your church. And then obviously it is important for us to get your feedback and, and perceptions about the, your involvement and our involvement. Lastly, uh, we are requesting from your side how you can support us. The Welfare Weekend is an important one. Once a year, last weekend of, not just the day, last weekend, please put it in your diaries. I know it's, 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 uh, it's in, on the AFM, di in the AFM diary. Please put it on your di diary as well. At least one rent per member per month campaign. Some people are counting the members, it's, it's 12 rent a month, a year, and they're giving that, those amounts to us. Please, we need your help around that as well. Uh, Advocate Molly will be running a campaign, reaching out to you. Please support her as well. And then advice needed on how, and I feel this, there's a partnership needed between us and, and, and the GS's uh, office in terms of how can we support the emeriti pastors? How can they be mobilized uh, to do some work for us by going out to the various assemblies and in that way earn some money as well? In closing, vulnerable people are precious. Handle with prayer. 
Okay is also important, but prayer is most important. I thank you. My contact details are on the screen. It's Ashley Theron, 083-825-9699. And my email address is very straightforward. It's Ashley T. Um, it's on the screen at afmwelfare.org.za. God bless you. And now it's time for us just to engage with one another in terms of what questions you have so that I can respond to those or come back to you with the answers and the responses. Thank you so much.